Let's get into it. I am Mal Foster, and you are listening <laughs> to my Alexa going off. So, obviously, that was a timer that was going off on Alexa. I don't know what it was for. You would actually have to ask my wife about that. And while you're there, you can ask her what she's playing at by putting lime in a mug of tea. Yeah, exactly. So, for anyone that's been going through the real-life adaptation of the Necronomicon that we have called 2020 with a loved one, a partner, a spouse, whatever, you will know that this whole shebang has thrown numerous obstacles amongst us, in front of us, to test our relationships. Even if you're not quarantined with someone in a romantic relationship, if you're in the house with a friend, a family member, a roommate, you will have found this whole compressed, condensed slant on your relationship to be testing and trying at time. It's only natural because really we're living in a pressure cooker with the people we love and it's going to get difficult at times. But from my personal perspective, the biggest obstacle that my marriage during this whole thing may have faced happened about 10 minutes before recording this. When my wife decided to make a brew with lime. Not only is this wrong, it's sacrilegious, and it's a slap in the face of mugs of tea everywhere. Everyone knows there is only one way to make a mug of tea, one way to brew up, and it's this. It's the tried and tested formula of hot water, Yorkshire tea bag, which admittedly she did use, which made it worse. Because she's not just ruining tea, she's ruining Yorkshire tea. But anyway, as I said, everyone knows this is the one formula. Hot water, Yorkshire tea bag, milk or milk replacement, almond milk would be a good one, and two sugars. That's it. You don't need to be fighting around with fruits and honeys and spices and all this. It's just, it's just no. That's what it is. It's just no. Anyway, you are listening to the latest episode of Dined Out. This week, it is just me, no guests. No fantastic conversations, unless you count me just talking to you as a fantastic conversation, which you should do, because it is. So, yeah, that's it. You just get the solitary ear treat that is me talking to you. In this episode, we are going to be diving headfirst down the pipeline of history to commemorate the 75th anniversary of VJ Day. That's right, this week, 75 years ago, for a lot of people, myself included, the Second World War came to an end. Think about that for a minute. A defining moment that just changed and altered the structure of the world came to an end 75 years ago this week. So to commemorate that, we are going to be looking at the Second World War, but in the only way that Dimed Out possibly could, from a slightly abstract and strange angle. In this episode, we are going to be looking at some failed weapons of the Second World War. Now, when I say weapons, I mean legit, well, actually, kind of. You'll understand when we get there. What we're not going to be covering is that whole subsection of Hitler and his obsession with the occult and his attempts to create and craft magical and mystical weaponry. Yeah, because that thing is so niche and so fantastically weird... I feel like if we were going to touch on that, that needs to be a separate episode all of its own. All of the hearsay, all of the rumours, all of the the ideas that apparently were floating around. It's a very bizarre rabbit hole, which, as I said, if we're going to touch upon, I think we need to do in its own particular episode. What we are actually going to be covering in this one, though, is two weapons that are just... Absolutely insane, yet were planned, put together, researched, tested, and ultimately never actually made it to the battlefield. But 
unbelievably were considered potential weapons of war. To counterbalance this, we're going to be looking at some successful missions that happened during the Second World War, some successful covert special operations that are just incredible and insane and just, yeah. I really enjoyed putting this episode together. I hope you guys enjoy it too. So, here's a question for you. What do you do when Hitler and the Nazis construct a 10-foot-high, 7-foot fake concrete wall all along the coast of continental Europe? Well, you build yourself a massive rocket-powered wheel full of explosives, which you can fire from a ship and send barreling into said absolute unit of solid denial. Obviously. Doi. Bonus question. Name a narcissistic fascist who didn't deliver on his promise to build a giant wall. It's okay, I'll give you a minute to think it over. So, the Great Pangendrum, which is actually its name, I know, it sounds like an exotic magician. It's not, unless there is actually an exotic magician out there called the Great Pangendrum, which, in that case... Apologies, but you should also maybe think of picking a different name, one that isn't associated with a massive whirling wheel of explosive death. Just, you know, a suggestion. Anyway, the Great Pangendrum, which was not an exotic magician, but it was a crazy covert plan that was put in action in order to breach a part of the Atlantic Wall. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Atlantic Wall was basically a series of structures and fortifications put in place by Nazi Germany. And the Panjandrum itself, it consisted of two wooden wheels, which were about 10 feet in diameter, and it had a drum full of explosives. So imagine, if you will, a giant wheel of sticky tape. But instead of sticky tape, it housed plenty of kaboom. Now, the reason for the Panjandrum... Oh, wow, that was... Yeah, let's try that again, only this time, let's not power down like a droid. So, the reason for the Panjandrum's existence in the first place was basically because the beaches surrounding the wall were deemed too dangerous for anyone trying to deploy an explosive by hand. So, the general idea was that this giant wheel would be launched from a ship and then propelled across the sea and then across the sand towards its target via cordite rocket... Cord- oh, my days. Basically, it had rockets attached to the wheels which would ignite upon launch, fly out from the ship, across the sea, across the sand, straight into the wall, and boom. You know, simple. Right? That was it. That was the plan. Fire the big exploding wheel from a ship towards the wall, and blow! Victory. But where exactly do you test such a device? I mean, we're talking about a giant wheel of explosives. So, naturally, the only place to test such a thing is at a popular seaside resort. Obviously. That's right, the Panjan drum was put through its paces on the beaches of Westwood Ho. Yeah, that is also a real name. It's a ridiculous sounding name, but nonetheless it is actually a real place. A real place which I feel like the only appropriate way to say it is kind of like Thundercats Ho. So, let's try that again. That's right, the Panjan drum was put through its paces on the beach of Westwood Ho! Which again is actually a real place, and at the time it was a real popular place for tourists and holidaymakers looking to escape. So, you know, obviously the British military had to test it here. It was not so subtle and definitely not so secret. But yeah, the beaches of Westwood Ho is where they tested their wheel of misfortune in front of thousands of British beach dwellers. I mean, I guess on the plus side, at this point in time, any would-be visitors to Westwood Ho wouldn't have had to concern themselves with German tourists laying down a towel to claim the best seats on the beach. So, you know, there's that. Anyway, despite their best efforts, testing of the Panjandrum didn't go quite so well as rockets would become dislodged and the Panjandrum would veer way off course 
almost killing an army cameraman who was filming the tests. That's right, footage of this thing and the tests exists and I implore you to check it out. In fact, head to dimed-out.com and check the show notes for this episode because what I will do is I will throw the appropriate video in there for you to see for yourself. It's insane. Anyway, where were we? Uh, yes, erratic wheel of death tearing through the beach. So a third wheel was added to the Panjandrum for additional stability, but no dice. They also tried equipping a steering system with steel cables, but that didn't work either. In fact, when one of the cables snapped, it almost decapitated a member of the team. In short, unsurprisingly, despite further tests, the Panjan drum was pretty much a colossal failure. Much like the general idea behind it, the launch was good, but ensuring stable movement and forward motion was evidently too much to ask for. The lifespan of the Panjan drum was about six months, and although it didn't come to fruition, it certainly makes for an interesting part of the Second World War's rich history. conclude this section about weaponry by talking about bat bombs. Yes, that's right, you did hear me correctly. Bat bombs. An absolutely insane idea that was conceived by a dentist who sounds like a character from a children's book, a man who went by the name of Little Adams, or in 2020 would now be known as Lil Adams. That's his, his rap name, that's his side hustle. Although, to be fair, his main job is being a dentist, and then his side hustle is making weapons for the military, so I guess his rap career would be his side side hustle? Or maybe just a hobby. Probably just a hobby. Anyway, Little Adams was an acquaintance of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, and after taking a trip to Carlsbad Caverns National Park, which is, by the way, home to many bats, he penned a letter to the White House in January 1942. As a response to the Pearl Harbor bombings that had occurred the previous year, Little Adams put aside his microphone, put aside his drill, and those tiny little mirrors. You know, the ones that dentists just love shoving in your mouth so they can see in those hard-to-reach places? He put all of those aside in favour of developing what is, quite frankly, an absolutely guano military plan. Knowing that bats like to roost, and that most of the buildings in Tokyo were actually made of wood, Adams concocted the following plan. Step 1. Attach time-released explosive to bats. Step two, drop a container of bats over Tokyo. Step three, wait for bats to get comfy and roost in on or around buildings. Step four, blow all of them up. In his letter to the White House, Adams declared that, and I quote, the bat was the lowest form of animal life and that they were created by God to play their part in the scheme of free human existence and to frustrate any attempt of those who dare desecrate our way of life. Yeah. Now to me, it seems that Little Adams wasn't so much concerned about helping the war effort, as he was spearheading his own bad genocide. I mean, these are the words of a man who clearly has been festering and harbouring a hatred for bats for some time, and has now just found a legit excuse to kill them all. Amazingly, his idea was actually approved by President Roosevelt, and then it was sent on to the US Army Air Force. By the way, Little Adams wasn't just a demented ideas man that was fueled by some bizarre, inexplicable hatred towards winged mammals. He was actually a key part in developing the idea, and was actually allowed to assemble a crack team that would see his plan come to fruition. Kind of. Little Adam's bomb squad consisted of numerous individuals, including a mammologist, a former gangster, a former hotel manager, and Tim Holt, an actor who was best known for B-movie westerns. 
Although, to be fair to Tim Holt, he actually was a combat veteran who received a Purple Heart for his service, so alongside the Mammologist, he's probably the person in that whole ensemble with the most credibility, weirdly enough. With the idea approved and the team assembled, testing soon began. And variables that were considered in the experimentation period were what kind of species of bat should be used, what kind of explosive should be used to blow up said species of bat, and at what temperature should the bats be stored at and transported. After testing different types of bat, the Mexican free-tailed bat was eventually selected as the unlucky critter, and napalm was picked as the explosive of choice. Eventually, little Adams and the boys got to gluing, yes, gluing, little containers of napalm to the front of each bat. The bats were then to be placed inside sheet metal tubes which were approximately 5 feet long. Each tube could hold, if you were wondering, roughly 1,000 bats, and when it came to game day, the tubes would be dropped from a plane. They would then deploy a parachute, and the sides would fall away, dispersing all of the bomb bats into the city of Tokyo. So, with an absolutely mental plan assembled, testing soon began. An initial test took place in Carlsbad, New Mexico in May 1943, but... It didn't quite go to plan, as when the bats were released, they decided to roost underneath a fuel tank and incinerated the entire testing range. Another test, this time a successful one, took place three months later on a mock-up Japanese village that was erected on a testing site in Utah. More tests were actually planned to occur throughout 1944, but the bat bombs were not expected to be actually combat-ready until 1945. At this time, the operation was moving too slowly and had been greatly overtaken by the atomic bomb project. So, after spending $2 million, which is the equivalent of $19 million by today's standards, the program was subsequently cancelled. Millions of dollars, thousands of bats, hundreds of hours, all gone with nothing to show. But think about this. Had Little Adam's project come together faster, then perhaps the world as we know it now would be completely different. If the US had dropped several tubes filled with exploding bats instead of Fat Man and Little Boy, then the scale of devastation and the loss of human life would have been far smaller. The atomic future that followed may not have come to fruition, and the country of Japan may not have had to go through such a literal and cultural phase of rebuilding. Had Little Adam's demented idea actually come to life and been used? Then exploding bats may have changed the narrative of the world as we know it. And that alone is a crazy thing to even contemplate. We now move into the second part of the show, and this half is dedicated to unorthodox missions and covert operations, and we're starting, oddly enough, with the topically titled Operation Corona, an initiative that was both brilliant and lavered with irony. In an effort to confuse, divert, and, let's be honest, in a way, troll German night fighters, Britain's Royal Air Force put together and conducted Operation Corona, a mission which saw the RAF recruit native German speakers to initiate radio communications with German pilots. Once on the airwaves, they would countermand previously given orders, cancel flight plans, and divert pilots. And in one instance, I believe a German pilot was actually redirected to an RAF airbase and then detained. The kicker to all this is that most of the faux German air traffic controllers were actually Jewish refugees who had fled Nazi Germany and come to England. Their ability to speak the language fluently with a natural accent made them the perfect candidate. Now, obviously, the Luftwaffe eventually caught on to what was happening and so took countermeasures. They replaced all their male flight controllers with females, probably thinking they were being real slick in the process. However, this did not stop or even deter Operation Corona, because when the Germans altered their approach, so did the RAF. What they did, to countermeasure the Germans' countermeasure, was they recruited German-speaking personnel from the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. (music) 
Our next featured mission could possibly be the very dictionary definition of badass. Operation Frankton was a commando raid on cargo ships that were stationed in the Nazi-occupied Bay of Biscay Port in Bordeaux, France. And it was undertaken by a small group of British Royal Marines named, get this, the Royal Marines Boom Patrol Detachment. Boom Patrol. Told you it was badass. On the 30th of November 1942, 12 Marines, one reserve and six two-man canoes, all kayaks for you outdoorsy adventurous American types, were transported via a submarine from Scotland to the Gironde estuary in France. The squad was split into two separate divisions. Division A consisted of Herbert Blondie Hassler and Bill Sparks in Canoe Catfish, Albert Laver and William Mills in Canoe Crayfish, and George Sheard and David Moffat in Canoe Conga. Division B consisted of John McKinnon and James Conway in Canoe Cuttlefish, Samuel Wallace and Robert Ewart in Canoe Coalfish, and W.A. Ellery and E. Fisher in Canoe Catchalot. To infiltrate the port and avoid detection, the 12 Marines were scheduled to paddle under the cover of night from the estuary all the way to Bordeaux. Once at their destination, they would attack the targeted ships with limpet mines before hot fudding it out of the port and escaping to Spain. But not everything went to plan. For starters, Canoe Catchlot had its hull damaged when it was being passed out of the submarine, and that reduced the mission initially to ten men and five canoes, or as they were rather adorably referred to, cockles. So the remaining five cockles set out on the evening of the 7th of December, but that first night proved problematic, to say the least. Courtesy of cross tides, cross winds and high waves, canoe coalfish disappeared, whilst conga capsized. The two men operating conga, Sheard and Moffat, held on to the two other canoes until they could make it safely to shore, where they would then meet up with the missing coalfish. The remaining canoes continued to push on, but as they reached a major checkpoint in the river, they came across three German ships. In the pitch black, in the dead of night, the remaining marines laid flat on their canoes and silently paddled on, as quietly as they possibly could. And amazingly, they remained undetected. But during this stealthy evasion, canoe cuttlefish became separated from the other two canoes. The inhabitants of Cuttlefish, John McKinnon and James Conway, found their way to shore before attempting to make it back to the border of Spain. But after four days of evasion, they were eventually captured and turned over to a group of Germans stationed at a hospital some 30 miles southeast of Bordeaux. At this time, Samuel Wallace and Robert Ewart, the marines that were operating Canoe Coalfish, they had also been captured. So, this left two canoes. Herbert Blondie Hasler and Bill Sparks in Canoe Catfish, and Albert Laver and William Mills in Canoe Crayfish. Upon reaching Bordeaux on the 11th of December, the attack began at approximately 9pm. Like absolute ninjas, Hasler and Sparks snuck into the port and planted all eight limpet mines on four separate vessels before making their escape. At the same time, Laver and Mills planted their mines on a large cargo ship and a small liner before departing. Both canoes met each other downstream by chance and continued their escape until 6am when they left their canoes and continued on foot. To increase their odds of escaping safely, each team set off towards the border of Spain separately. On December the 18th, Hansler and Sparks reached the French town of Ruffock, which was about 100 miles from where they had beached their canoes. They hid out on a farm for 18 days before being escorted on foot across the Pyrenees Mountains into Spain. Word of their safe passage, however, would not reach Britain until the 23rd of February. Hasler then returned home by air and landed back in Britain on the 2nd of April, whereas Sparks went by sea and wouldn't return until much later. Still, despite the delay, they were both safe. Unfortunately, the same couldn't be said for the rest of their squad. On the 8th of December, Albert Laver and William Mills had been captured, and according to a German report... They had been, and I quote, finished off in combat. Samuel Wallace and Robert Ewitt of Canoe Coalfish were executed by German forces, as were John McKinnon and James Conway of Canoe Cuttlefish, whilst George Shepard 
and David Moffat died of hypothermia after the conga canoe capsized. Only two of the original ten men survived the raid of Operation Frankton, but each one of the cockleshell heroes as they came to be known played a significant part in an incredible, dangerous and courageous mission that without question left a sizable dent in the war effort. From one brilliant submarine base mission to another, although this one is even more out of the box than the previous. Operation Mincemeat sounds awful, I know, but it is a fantastic, chonky slice of deception, if ever there was one. So, in 1939, shortly after the start of the war, there was a document doing the rounds called the Trout Memo, which granted also sounds awful. Anyway, the Trout Memo was essentially a strategic paper full of schemes which could be used against the enemy. At the time, it was attributed to the Director of Naval Intelligence, Rear Admiral John Godfrey. However, although it was published under Godfrey's name, it's believed by some, mainly historian Ben McIntyre, that the Trout Memo bore all the hallmarks of Godfrey's assistant, Lieutenant Commander Ian Fleming. Yes, that Ian Fleming. You know, Bond. James Bond. Murderous tough. Purveyor of rampant misogynism. Fighter of fellas with metal teeth and fellas with dangerous hats. Evidently, on a completely unrelated side tangent, Harold Sakata, the guy who played Odd Job in the Bond movies, he actually won a silver medal in weightlifting at the 1948 Olympic Games. So, you know, you have that piece of useless information in your brain now. Yeah, you're welcome. Anyway, idea number 28 in the Trout Memo was titled A Suggestion, in parenthesis, not a very nice one, and it really isn't. Anyway, idea 28, it was essentially the idea of planting misleading documents on a corpse that could be found by the enemy. Fast forward to September 1942, and a plane that was flying from Britain to Gibraltar crash-landed off the coast of the Spanish city Cadiz. Everybody on board the plane was killed, including James Haddon Turner, who was a French agent, and a courier, who just happened to be carrying classified documents, which included a top-secret letter. Turner's body, complete with secret letter, was washed upon the beach, and then discovered by Spanish authorities, who in turn handed it over to the British. Now, it was determined that the top-secret letter had not been opened, but intelligence experts established that Taylor's notebook had been copied, which more than suggested that some material obtained by the Spanish had been passed on to the Germans. It was this particular incident which inspired British intelligence officer Charles Cholmondeley, Cholmondeley, yeah, Charles Charizard, I'm just going to call him Charles from now on, that's going to be way easier for everybody. Anyway, Charles concocted his own version of idea number 28 from the Trout Memo based on this incident, and his plan, which was given the codename Trojan Horse, was as follows. A body is obtained from one of the London hospitals, the lungs are then filled with water, and the documents are disposed in an inside pocket. The body is then dropped by a coastal command aircraft. On being found, the suspicion in the enemy's mind may well be that one of our aircrafts has either been shot or forced down, and that this is one of their passengers. Alongside naval representative Ewan Montague, Charles got to work. But first, they needed a body. But not just any body. One that could fool a Spanish pathologist. One that could be passed off as a victim of drowning. But, obtaining a body, it's not as easy as you might think. Not that I know anything about that. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's legal issues. And, and stuff regarding that sort of thing. Anyway, eventually, on the 28th of January 1943, to be precise, Charles and Ewan got hold of a suitable cadaver. A homeless Welshman named... Oh, God, let's try this. Glindwyr? Michael. Glindwyr... Glyn... Glindwyr... Glyn... Glyn. I'm just going to call him Glyn from now on. 
So, Glyn Michael, a uh, homeless Welsh guy, had died from eating rat poison, which, yeah, sure, is a horrible way to go, absolutely. But a small amount of poison in his system would not be identified in a body that was supposed to have been floating in the sea for a few days. So, with a suitable candidate, they put Glyn's corpse in a mortuary fridge, which, if you're wondering, was running at a steady temperature of 4 degrees Celsius or 39 Fahrenheit. Any colder, and his flesh would freeze, which would be obvious once he had defrosted. They also had a time limit of three months, otherwise the body would decompose past the point of use. And if all of this sounds vaguely horrible, that's because it is. So, with Glyn on ice, the plan was then sent up the chain of command, and was eventually approved. Trojan Horse then became Operation Mincemeat, and Glenn was in the process of obtaining a brand new identity. After some deliberation, Glyn Michael then became Captain Acting Major William Martin. The name Martin was picked as there were several men with that name at around that rank in the Royal Marines, and the rank itself of Acting Major, it made him senior enough to be entrusted with sensitive documents, but not so prominent that anyone would expect to know him. To really reinforce the ruse, Major Martin was given a fake backstory which included a fraudulent fiancé by the name of Pam. A photo of Pam, which in reality was a stage picture of an MI5 clerk named Jean Leslie, was created, as were two love letters from Pam, and a receipt for an engagement ring, a letter from Major Martin's fake dad, a letter from his bank, and a note from the family solicitor. All of these documents, which were referred to as pocket litter, were created with the aim of being put on the body to make it look even more authentic. That's some pretty impressive attention to detail, right? But get this, to ensure the fake documents were actually legible once the body had been fished out of the water, they conducted a series of experiments to see which one would last the longest while submerged in the water. Those weren't the only phony documents they made, other items included ticket stubs from a London theatre and a bill for four nights lodging at a naval and military club. They even made him fake naval ID cards. Now obviously they couldn't photograph Glyn's corpse and use that because he's dead and it would be kind of obvious that he's dead. So they conducted a search to find someone who looked like Glyn. Step forward, Captain Ronnie Reed of MI5. Reed agreed to have his picture taken whilst wearing a Royal Marine uniform. And get this, to add even more fake manufactured authenticity into the mix, the recently minted cards looked too new for a long-standing officer, so they were issued as replacements for lost originals. Furthermore, to give the IDs a more lived-in look, Ewan Montague, and I kid you not, this is crazy, but at the same time, it's actually kind of ingenious. Ewan Montague spent the next few weeks rubbing all three fake ID cards against his trousers, in order to give them more of a vintage look. And that's not it. To give Major Martin's uniform more of a well-worn appearance, Charles wore the uniform, the same one that would actually go on the body. And if that wasn't enough, then... And bear with me on this one, because I'm still getting my head around it. Because Major Martin was supposed to be a man of some means, a somewhat affluent gentleman, you might say then he would have been expected to have high-quality, nice underwear. But due to wartime rationing, obtaining nice underwear, it wasn't easy. And evidently, none of the intelligence officers were willing to lend theirs for the cause. So, they had to obtain some from another source. The source in question was Herbert Fisher, an English historian, educator, and politician. Now, the funny thing here is... Operation Mincemeat was being prepped in 1943. Herbert Fisher died in 1940. So, in essence, to give Major Martin the full, unprecedented air of authenticity, Charles had to break in a pair of dead man's underoos and then slide them onto another dead body. Ugh. But what about the letters of misinformation, I hear you asking? I mean, it's all very well creating false love letters and obtaining deceptive underpants, but what about the fake battle plans? That's a good question. Well, at the time, Hitler was concerned with an invasion of the Balkans, which, in short, is an area of southeastern Europe that includes Bulgaria, Albania, Croatia, and specifically in this instance, Greece. 
The Balkans were a major source of materials for the German war effort, in particular copper, chrome and oil, so obviously Adolf was fearful of this being hit, or even worse, taken over. Therefore the faux info was specifically designed to make him think that this was going to happen. The documents included a letter from Lieutenant General Sir Archibald Nye, actually written by the man himself to convey the most natural sounding fake letter possible. In it, it detailed plans to send extra reinforcements for an assault on Cape Aprox and Kalamata, both significant, would-be, strategic points in Greece. Now, this little detail is some seriously top-notch, old-school espionage. To know whether or not the letter had been read, the British placed a single eyelash within the letter. So if it came back untampered, the eyelash would still be there. However, if the Germans had taken themselves a little sneaky peek, the eyelash would be gone. Alongside the pretend battle plans, there was also a fake letter from Major Martin's higher-ups discussing how Martin himself was being sent on loan as a war expert until the invasion was over. The letter included a clumsy joke about sardines with the hope that it would be seen as a reference to an impending attack on the island of Sardinia. With all the documents gathered and forged, it was go time, right? Time to get Operation Mincemeat off the ground and into the water. Uh, almost, almost there. But there is one more concern with the operation, and that is the idea that perhaps if the documents are stashed on the body, they won't actually be found because of Roman Catholic prejudice against tampering with corpses. Which, let's be honest, there should just be a general rule about tampering with corpses. Unless you're a trained professional, don't do it. Because this was a viable concern, they had to think of an alternative, a different approach. And that came in the form of stashing the misinformation inside of a briefcase, which was connected to a leather-bound chain that was attached to the wrist of Major Martin. So, now they've got that sorted, they can just crack on with the mission, right? Right? I mean, they've got the body, the body's got a new identity, the identity's got a backstory, the backstory is supported by plenty of fake documents, so it's it's good to go, right? Yeah, with the, the exception of, of one thing, just, just one more thing. Uh, where are we going to drop the body? And how are we going to drop the body? I say we as if I actually had anything to do with this. Or that I am actually planning on just leaving a fake dead body somewhere to be found. Which, you know, just for the record, I had absolutely nothing to do with this. I had no part to play in Operation Mincemeat. I just want to make that perfectly clear. Anyway, after some consideration and consultation, Hoover, and I think I'm saying that right, but then again, I'm probably most likely... Chances are definitely not saying it right, but Hoover, that is the place that was selected. I also have no idea why I'm saying it like that, because it doesn't sound Spanish at all. If anything, it sounds Nordic, like an inquisitive Viking on a ship heading towards battle, asking his long-standing female companion a question. Hoover, have you seen Olaf? Does he know where the oxen are? I have no idea what this is turning into, by the way. Not a clue. And for the record, just in case you were wondering, I'm actually not a Viking either. So didn't have anything to do with mincemeat. And I'm definitely not a Viking. Although I do have some Nordic DNA. I had one of those genealogy tests done. My wife got it done for me for Christmas. And yeah, it turns out I have uh, some Nordic DNA in me. And also a very high percentage of Neanderthalism, if that's a thing. Yeah, basically my, my Neanderthal percentage is pretty high, which kind of says a lot. Anyway, Hoover was selected <laughs> because it was believed the tides and currents in that region would be the most accommodating to get the body where it needed to be. Plus, and this is definitely a good reason to pick Hoover, it was known that a very active German agent operated in that area, one that had made connections with Spanish officials. 
The initial idea for delivery was basically to simulate the very accident that they were trying to pass off as real as the actual cause of Major Martin's death and wayward trajectory. However, the use of sea flares and other devices would have run the risk of the body being picked up early, so it was decided that the body would be transported via submarine. However, to keep the corpse as fresh as possible, it had to be carried inside the submarine inside an airtight container. Like a giant Tupperware box for dead fake bodies. So, finally, after all this preparation, it was go time. Yes, Operation Mincemeat was ready to commence. In the early hours of the 17th of April, 1943, Glyn Michael, now dressed as Major William Martin, was ready to be deployed for his... Well, well, actually, he wasn't. You see, the operation hit a last-minute snag, as Major Martin's feet had frozen, and they couldn't get his boots on. What an absolute nightmare, but we've all been there, right? We all know what that is like, but don't you worry, not to worry, it is just a small hiccup along the way, because somebody had found an electric fire, and after a few moments of toasting Major Martin's dead frozen tuddies, those boots just slipped straight on. Fully dressed and with his fake personal documents on his person and his fake military documents in his briefcase, Major Martin was stuffed inside his airtight container, which was subsequently filled with 21 pounds of dry ice and then sealed up. Once stuffed inside of his airtight container, Dr. Martin, no, not Dr. Martin, that's wrong, that's a completely different fake body. Major Martin was loaded into the back of a van, which of course was driven by a former race car champion. Because, yeah, at this point, it would be absolutely ridiculous if just some average person with a driver's license took him. Had to be that guy. Had to be Speedy Tony with all of his medals and trophies for driving cars fast. Which, presumably, he did all through the night up to Greenock in West Scotland, where Major Martin, not Dr. Martin, was loaded into a submarine named the HMS Seraph. On the 19th of April, the Seraph set sail, and 11 days later, on the 30th of April, at 4.15am, it surfaces in the desired location. The container is taken onto the deck, and Major Martin's body is lowered into the sea. 12 miles away, the Seraph destroyed the container with plastic explosives, and then sent word back to Britain that Operation Mincemeat was complete. Some five hours after being deposited, the body of Major Martin was discovered by a local fisherman and was then taken to Hoover by Spanish soldiers who handed it over to a naval judge. Word of the body's discovery was sent to the British who, in turn, began exchanging messages internally. So, here is where we get another chunky slice of amazing deception. So, the British are sending these messages internally fully aware that the Germans were actually intercepting their diplomatic cables. However, the Germans didn't know that they knew. So this faux correspondence was a double bluff of sorts and only solidified the ongoing ruse. Especially when the Germans actually intercepted one of these diplomatic cables, decoded it and found a message between British intelligence officers that basically said, get that body and that briefcase back here immediately. Speaking of, on the 5th of May, the briefcase was passed to a naval headquarters at San Fernando near Cadiz, where it would then be forwarded over to Madrid. However, whilst at San Fernando, the contents of the briefcase were photographed, but the letter wasn't opened until the briefcase found its way to Madrid, during which the contents of the case came to the attention of Carl Eric Kulenthal, one of the most senior abware agents in Spain. I'm probably pronouncing a lot of words really badly there, but the point that I want to make here is if you don't know, which I actually didn't before this, the abware, abware, I, uh, yeah, who knows if that's correct or not, was the military intelligence for Germany. Anyway, Kulenthal asked Wilhelm Canaris, who was the head of the Abwa, to personally intervene, and upon his request, the Spanish actually allowed access to the contents of the letter. 
they remove the still damp paper by tightly winding it round a probe into a cylindrical shape and then pulling it out between the envelope flap, which was still closed by a wax seal, and the envelope body. The letters were dried and photographed, then soaked in salt water for 24 hours before being reinserted into their envelopes, without the eyelash. The information was then passed to the Germans on the 8th of May, and apparently the information obtained was deemed so important by German intelligence that Karl Erich Kuhlenhal took the copied documents back to Germany himself. So what happened then, you might very well be wondering. Well, don't worry, because I'm about to tell you. On the 11th of May, the briefcase was returned to Spanish authorities and then forwarded to Britain. Once back in Britain, the missing eyelash was noted and the documents were forensically tested. Results of those tests show that the fibres of the paper had been damaged after being folded more than once. So, basically, a bunch of scientists and boffins managed to find out that the Germans had actually been having a little bit of a sneaky peek at the top-secret stuff. Now, to throw the Germans off the scent and keep them thinking that they were still two moves ahead, another set of scripted messages were sent. This time, they detailed how the briefcase had been safely returned and the documents had not been tampered with. This was further reinforced through another message that was also leaked to the kind of Spaniards that were a little cosy with the Germans and also quite fond of gossiping. So, with the ruse complete and the Germans thinking basically that they're hot fudge because they've got the knowledge drop on the Allies, Hitler went into strategy mode. Fearful that the Balkans would be stormed, he relocated the 1st Panzer Division from France to Salonika which is the second largest city in Greece and the latest mispronunciation. Oh my goodness, I can't even say that. I can't even pronounce mispronunciation. Mispronunciation? Oh, I give up. So, <laughs> as I was saying, Hitler was getting his knickers in the twist and was getting a little bit panicky. He relocated the 1st Panzer Division from France to Salonika. Yeah, you like that? Yeah. And he doubled troop deployment on Sardinia to a total of 10,000. Another two panzer divisions were also transferred from the Eastern Front to the Balkans. The German presence in Greece went from one single division to eight, whilst 10 German divisions were deployed to Greece. So to say that he was a little bit rattled and a little bit scared is a bit of an understatement. This whole reaction is actually also just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, it was a major military overhaul to defend areas that were never under threat in the first place. What a flex. I mean, not only did it make the Nazis look like a bunch of stupid idiot brains and incompetent nerf herders, but it sorely weakened their presence in key parts of Europe. On the 9th of July, the Allies launched an invasion of Sicily dubbed Operation Husky. This not only allowed the Allies to take a stronghold and major focus points, but it also contributed to the downfall and imprisonment of the not-so-human potato riddled with all sorts of awful that was Benito Mussolini. Despite getting absolutely spanked, Hitler wasn't prepared to admit that he was wrong. Sound familiar? And maintained the attack on Sicily was a feint that preceded a real attack on the Balkans. What an idiot sandwich. Following the success of Operation Mincemeat, Ewan Montague was appointed an office of the Order of the British Empire in 1944, and Charles, oh, let's have a go at this, Charles Cholomendely was appointed a member of the Order in 1948. Montague went on to write a book loosely based on the mission named The Man Who Never Was. It was published in 1953 and then subsequently turned into a film three years later. It has since been turned into a musical, performed initially by a Welsh theatre group in 2015, and then by a London company in 2019. As a PS to this incredible story, I want to end with this, because it only seems fitting, as without him, this whole thing, it just wouldn't be possible. So, after being discovered, the body of Major William Martin was given an autopsy, and it was declared that his cause of death was asphyxiation through immersion in the sea. The ruse had worked completely, in every sense. His body was then buried in Nuresta Sonora Cemetery in Hoover, 
with full military honours on the 2nd of May 1943. In 1997, 20 years after taking responsibility for his grave, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission added the postscript. Glyndwia Michael served as Major William Martin. And I think that is fantastic. Because, as I said, without Glyn, without Glyndwia Michael, this whole thing wouldn't have happened. So there you go, that was the absolutely mind-boggling story behind Operation Mincemeat, which was just absolutely endlessly fascinating. One of the things I love most about this show as the platform that it is becoming, and particularly these episodes, is diving into rabbit holes I didn't even know existed. Which hopefully is what this show has been for you, what this episode has been. Hopefully you came in as a blank canvas. You didn't know about Panjandrums and Operation Mincemeat. If you did, then hopefully it's been somewhat vaguely entertaining. If you didn't, hopefully it's been somewhat vaguely entertaining and insightful. To keep the commemoration and celebration of VJ Day, the 75th anniversary of VJ Day rolling, if you've got stories, missions, anecdotes, operations, real life heroes that have infinitely fascinated you, then share them. Let me know. I want to dig a little deeper into this rabbit hole. Never thought I would. Never thought I'd be one of those guys. And I don't think I'm going to be one of those guys that are really into this in a full time capacity. But doing the research for this show has definitely awoken an interest in digging deeper into this topic. So if there are things that you think I need to check out, please let me know what they are. The best way you can do that and just leave any comments regarding the show or suggestions is to get in touch with me via Twitter and you can find me at I am Mal Foster. That's the best way to get in touch with things you want to suggest, any recommendations you've got to give or just anything you want to say as, you know, long as it's nice. And on that note, that about does it for this week's episode. As always, if you want to show some love and support us out here at Dimed Out, you can do so in a number of ways. First and foremost, if you haven't done so already, then you should definitely subscribe to us via whatever platform you get your podcasts from. And if said platform allows you to give us a rating and a review, you could do that as well. And that would help us out tremendously. Also, next time you are doing the beep boops and you are on the internet, that's right, the internet, you can find our website by heading over to dimed-out.com. You'll find all the episodes, you'll find episode notes, um, show stuffs, extra finger majigs, and fun nuggets, or fuggets, as I like to call them. The best fugget that you can find these days is over on Facebook. If you go to facebook.com forward slash dimed out pod, you can find our dimed out Facebook page. But more importantly, you can find our live streams that I've been doing every Friday at 12.30 p.m. That's central time and 6.30 p.m. GMT. So yeah, head over to the Facebook page and uh, see the little bonus extras, the bonus fuggets which is about usually 30 minutes long and they tap into a topic or a theme or something that has occurred or been touched upon in that week's episode. Really kind of fun to do. It's interactive. It's live. You guys can ask questions. You can jump on board and talk about the topics as well. Essentially, it is a super good, fun, cool time every Friday, 12.30 p.m. Central Time. Speaking of super cool, good, fun times... Next week's episode is the first of two conversations with my very good friend Andy, who brings a whole bunch of joy to the episode and a whole bunch of insight on different things from mindfulness, meditation, affirmations, and if that wasn't enough, she teaches me an awful lot about TikTok, something that I knew next to nothing about until I spoke to her about it, and it's kind of relevant and topical right now so yeah maybe you know it like i did as just a goofy platform for people to do dance routines for turns out there's a lot more going on there than i ever imagined so yeah we're going to be covering those things and plenty more next week in the first of her two conversations on the show so yeah plenty of good stuff to look forward to but that is it for this week's episode and on that note i bid you adieu Look after yourselves, look after each other, and until next time, keep it 
don't out.